Welcome to What a Creep, the show with Margot Donahue and Sonia Mansfield talking about creeps from the past to the present. This is your quick guide to the biggest creeps, jerks, assholes, and losers, the best of the worst. From two nice ladies who want the world to be a little less creepy. Welcome back to What a Creep. This is Margot Donahue, and my cohort in creepitude, as always, is the amazing Sonia Mansfield. Hey, Sonia. Hello, my friend. Happy to be your cohort. I know. You, you were teaching me. Somebody was saying in our reviews that they're nitpicking, saying that we're just two people. And that doesn't mean we're cohorts, but we're all cohorts in creepitude. Everybody that listens yeah. to the show. Her, co- her co-pilot in creepitude. Whatever. It's just something I yeah. said, and it made me laugh. So anyway. Yeah. It's fine. It's fine. We're the show that talks about creeps from the past to the present. We're talking about a creep that's been in the media lately today. We do Mm -hmm. have a basic Facebook page, but we don't really use it. That's just a place where people go to complain about our language. Just letting you all know, we use salty language in this program. Yeah, fucking deal with it, cohorts. (laughs) If you want to interact with us, the place for most interactive is in our Facebook group. And it's a private group. You do have to ask to join. It's What a Creep podcast group. Group, Excuse me. Just don't act like a creep and you can hang out with your fellow cohorts and creepitude. (laughs) We're on Twitter as long as that exists at Creep Pod because somebody had What a Creep on Twitter. Yes, I am dead naming it, uh, but never used it. Creep. We're on Instagram and threads at What a Creep Podcast. And we have an old timey email, What a Creep Podcast at gmail.com. Please send us your suggestions for creeps and non creeps there. Or if you would like some stickers wherever you are on the planet of Earth, I will send them out to you. Just get me your address. Sonia, do you want to talk about the website? Is it working? (laughs) I'm sorry. It's a good question. I was just going to say, you can go to whatacreeppodcast.com and it's everything you ever wanted to know about our show, but we're afraid to ask. It's not as updated as I would like it because WordPress has been acting janky. Therefore, I'm entertaining the idea of moving it to another platform, but still it will be whatacreeppodcast.com. So you could still go there. Uh, And there are links to most of our episodes there. Maybe not the last few, because again, it's been acting weird. But you can click into each of those and you can see a list of our sources because we source every single thing we do. We're not making this up. We want to give credit to the journalists that are doing the work. If you're looking to do a deeper dive on any of our creeps, that's a great place to start. So do that. There's also a link to our merch shop. Our merch shop is updated. You could go to our merch shop. You could get T-shirts and tote bags and face masks because COVID's still a thing. Do it. There's new designs. Pondering more. You never (laughs) know. You never know what I'm going to put in there. Uh, There's also a link to our sub stack where you can sign up for our monthly newsletter, which is just uh, me ranting about creeps. And it drops hints about what's coming. There's also a link to our Patreon. You want to tell them about that, Margo? I knew there was more. Uh, but wait, there's more. There's P- more. P-A-T-R-E-O-N. That is our Patreon page. That's a place you can go to support us. We use the money for stuff like all of the news outlets all that we subscribe sources, to yeah, yeah. and the software and all that good stuff. We also have our first eight seasons. This is, by the way, season 22, episode one. Whoa. Whoa. So this- ha- this is amazing. This podcast is old enough for Dane Cook to marry it. <laughs> We're also sorry. I need a minute. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> We're going to have to put up season nine pretty soon, I think. But okay. anyway, right now there's season eight up there. We put out two, eight seasons, excuse me. They're also put out two bonus episodes every month. We put out two this week, so we do get them in there. <laughs> Usually, though, we space it out a little yeah, normally, bit normally, <laughs> Yeah, normally we space it out a little bit, but I was traveling and then I got the vid, you know, like you do. <laughs> like what, ha- so. what happens. So. Also, we'd like to thank people. I want to thank, first of all, Claudia, Laura, Rish, and Kelly, all of y'all for signing up for Patreon. We totally thank appreciate you. it. We're also going to be sending out holiday cards. So remember that all yes. Patreon members get those every year. And, yep. if, and if you would like to help us out, but money's tight, you know. Just tell a friend about the show, you know, put a sticker on your laptop, whatever. At yeah. the sh- but also leave us a review wherever you get your podcast. Be sure to subscribe, but also leave a review. And I'd like to thank Papa Ferriking, who was anyway talking about our cohort 
stuff. Yeah. And also, which is, by the way, is totally fine. Yeah, we were You're laughing about to, it. Yeah. We were goofing about it. And yeah. Smurf Kisser 17 for giving us five stars. Smurf Kisser. We love these names. Good names. What the Smurf? Are you ready, Sonia, for us to talk about our creep today? Can't wait. Okay. So excited. We are talking about Jan Wenner, who's been in the news. He A couple of weeks ago, he did a review, excuse me, an interview with the New York Times. He was the editor-in-chief of Rolling Stone magazine between 1967 and 2019. He was a, a cultural time. gatekeeper all that time. If mm-hmm. you were on the cover of Rolling Stone, you were cool. At least according to Jan Wenner. <laughs> this was, <laughs> you'd made it. Like you had made it, you know. It was a coveted thing to get. You wanted to be on the cover of Rolling Stone the way models want to be on the cover of Vogue. Correct, Sonia. Or like any other like Soap Opera Digest or the country music magazines. Whatever you're into, movie line, like, you know, this Rolling Stone was definitely, it was a music magazine. It was definitely white centered when it started. And it was supposedly Mm -hmm. getting better about that. And then he decided to release, he did a biography, autobiography, excuse me, last year that sold very well, Jan Wenner. And he did a lot of publicity Mm -hmm. for it. So he decided, you know what? Why don't I, what, I'm in my 70s. Why don't I put out a book, all of me interviewing my best, best friends and call them the masters of rock and roll. And they're all white men. (laughs) What could possibly... Yeah. And you could do Dude, that. Just, by the way, just rename your book. Just call it. I, these are my buds. I don't know. Yeah. These are right. I mean, it's it's my go to's. I don't care. But mm-hmm. language is important. Words matter. Yeah. We've talked about that many times on yes. this show. And people are allowed to say when they think you suck. They're allowed to say they yes. don't like what you're they don't like the cut of your jib and they're going to call you out. <laughs> I think that's that expression. I could be wrong about yes. that as well. <laughs> but it sounds right. Yeah. But let's talk about him. He's also the person that helped create the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and all the rules that has and all of the people that don't belong there, which is a long, long list, by the way, yeah. as well. But as I said, this is somebody who was a cultural gatekeeper. He told us what was cool and what was not cool, and he did it with an iron fist. Uh, He did it with this whole thing of a worship of celebrity and money and power Mm -hmm. that's, uh, I dare to say, Trumpian level. Yeah. I dare to say that, Sonia. Yes, you dare. I do dare. So I'm going to open up my Kindle, and then we'll go into the show. But I just want you to hear, put on my reading glasses as well, that would be helpful. This there you is go. The Masters. It was released on. Uh, that's my. That's my Kindle making those sounds. The Masters. Uh, it's it's conversations with Dylan Lennon, Jagger, Townsend, Garcia, and there's another one. Um, but he interviewed. These are his friends and the ones that are alive. He interviewed them, I guess, for one last time, and let them all edit the interview. Okay. All right. Which I'm like, it's just, come on. Right. I mean, anyway, this is from page two of The Masters. No, I didn't buy the whole book. You, get, you know, when you're on, you can hit the download and sample. I yeah. just sample. Yes. I just wanted his intro. Smart. Thank you. Because I did write another book about him. That's what I was doing all day today when we weren't getting flooded out of Park Slope, which is oh what's my happening here. It's like biblical levels of rain we're getting here. Anyway. This is his book, Jan Wenner. That there are no women or black musicians in this collection is reflective of the prejudices and practices of the times. As a white middle-class kid in the 50s and 60s, and as a more aware college student, I didn't hear such songs as Sam Cooke's A Change Change is Gonna Come as part of my zeitgeist. Zeitgeist is a big word for him, by the way. Mm-hmm. It was inspirational and transporting anthem, but I didn't internalize it as part of my struggle. My loss. If you look for it, the theme of feminization of behavior and values can be traced to the history of rock, not as a sexual pursuit, but as a liberating of gender in search of society where the insensitivity and brutality of male energy are restrained and balanced by nurturing compassion. 
Elvis and Little Richard wore eyeliner and quaffed themselves with care. The Beatles epitomized androgyny. Not really. Long yeah. hair and in your face sign of femininity. An in your face sign of femininity was now a principal flag wearing, uh, early flag wearing symbol of rock stardom. It was an early cry for equality and shared humanity. But he doesn't talk about women in his story. That's no. how, that's how he sees about it is how he sees it through the eyes of a white male. Yes, he's a white yeah. male, and I get that. Yeah, but he's also the editor in chief and founder of Rolling Stone magazine. You think yeah. he would be a bit more? But let's just go into his life a little bit. Yes, and then we'll go that. Okay, so he's born in the Bay Area. In he's born in New York City, but he was raised in the Bay Area. His mother and father bought a house in the fifties for three thousand dollars in San Rafael, and it was like several acres. And I mean, it's... <laughs> rent is more than that a month. Womp womp. <laughs> he's the son of Sim and Edward Wenner. Uh, they were a secular Jewish family. When his parents split up, he was sent to boarding school. He went to the Chadwick School, and then he attended University of California at Berkeley in 1963. You would hear Sam Cook if you went, I would think. But I didn't go to Berkeley in 63, so I don't know. I mean, um, I'm a white lady. Um, I've heard Sam Cook growing up. You know, I'm not as old as this dude. No. But he, before dropping out of Berkeley in 66, he was active in the free speech movement. Yada, yada, yada. He meets Ralph Gleason, who's this jazz critic for the San Francisco Chronicle. Yada, yada, yada. Yada, yada, yada. This man helps Jan come up with the idea of we need to make a magazine just for kids. And um, he wanted his big passion in life, which, by the way, I respect. He wanted to meet the Beatles and the Stones. So how do I do that? I'll make a magazine. I respect the shit out of that. Absolutely. Sure. Because that's what I would want to do, too. This is 1960s. Yeah. He borrows money from his parents, uh, $7,500, which is the equivalent of about seventy grand today. Okay. And they start this magazine, and they call it Rolling Stone, specifically so that he will meet the Rolling Stones. Okay. And they start their Sounds base. smart. It's very smart. He starts interviewing John Lennon right off the bat, and he, uh, and he has him on the cover of the magazine. It's um, a magazine that talks about politics. It's a magazine that has long hairs on the cover, and it becomes this cool countercultural thing. It's mm-hmm. based in San Francisco until 1977, so it's very Bay Area focused. Okay, and it's it's he gets married to Jane Scheindelheim. She goes by Jane Wenner. Uh, they were married from 67 to 1995. They had. Between them, multiple affairs. They had kind of an open relationship, but they didn't have kids until 1985. So it's 18 Hmm. years, starting the magazine, going through the 70s, and in the middle of the 80s, when he's probably having like a midlife crisis or whatever, he's like, (laughs) I want to be a father. (laughs) So he has three kids with her. Okay. Okay. Anyway, so the in 1970, he finally interv- gets to interview John Lennon and says, this is your chance. You could talk about why the Beatles broke up. Tell us all about Yoko and things like that. And he, uh, uh, John Lennon does give him the interview. And then it says he says to him, Jan says to John, you own this interview. When I'm done publishing it, I'm giving it to you. You own it. When he was done publishing it, it turned into this huge financial boon, and he was offered $40,000 for the rights, and he quickly sold them. So he sold his book for, uh, sold his interview as a book and didn't tell Lennon. Lennon had to find out. So this interview that he supposedly owned, (laughs) right. What a dick. And that's his first dick move. And then Lennon doesn't speak to him for years. So let me just get into my sources, like we say. Yeah. All right. Jan Wenner, 1967 to 2019, covering everything from the Beatles to Woodstock to Live Aid and even hip hop at some point in the 90s. Hey, hey, welcome to the show, (laughs) Rolling Stone. (laughs) He made millions as rock's culture, rock culture's gatekeeper and key in developing the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. For decades, critics derided Rolling Stone as a bastion for white male centered worldview with little appreciation for women or people of color. They were often, by the way, sexualized on his covers. That's Mm -hmm. how you got a cover with Rolling Stone if you were a black person or a woman or both. 
This past week, he, with an interview with the New York Times, released his book, and the title is The Masters, once again, Conversations with Bono, Dylan, Garcia, Jagger, Lennon, Springsteen, and Townsend. Let me just side note. Does anybody really need to hear from these people again? I mean, Garcia's gone, yes. Right. But, and Lennon, okay. But Bruce Springsteen put out his biography, autobiography like a couple of years ago he did an interview with howard stern that took like two hours bono put out his autobiography jagger's been interviewed 40 times by rolling stone yeah like pete townsend's been interviewed a whole bunch of times like is it really necessary dude just should have called it something else to be on it like it's almost like by calling it the masters he's insinuating that these are like like the best the of the best, best, the best, the best. Right? yes exactly and that their thoughts deeply matter more than anybody else's and all this stuff and it's like just if he had just called it anything else like i don't even know my faves rock on, yeah my faves <laughs> rock on rock you know or like i don't know rock talk or some bullshit <laughs> anything other than look what Rolling's- he called it he probably could have escaped controversy, but he didn't do that and said a bunch of stupid shit after. So, well, he was interviewed by the New York Times and it ran on the Friday before the Tuesday that it was published, which is a coup. You know, it's a big yeah. deal. And New York, Ma- I'm sorry, the New York Times put in there, you know, they put a link. They also recorded it so you could hear him talking his response so when he was asked why he didn't include any women or people of color his response when i was referring to the zeitgeist i was referring to black performers not female performers it's not that they're not creative geniuses it's not that they're inarticulate although go have a deep conversation with grace slick or janice joplin please be please be my guest the people i interviewed were the kind were the kind of philosophers of rock of black artists you know, Stevie Wonder, genius, right? I suppose when you use a word as broad as masters, the fault is using that word. Now, once again, masters over a black person, I Mm -hmm. maybe Marvin Gaye or Curtis Mayfield. I mean, they just didn't articulate at that level. And he also said the same with women. They were not articulating the way he like. So saying they're not articulate. Right. So today we're going to discuss his long career and where he winds up and why he winds up in the creep category. We're going to be the trigger warnings are racism, misogyny, sexual harassment and sexual assault. My sources are Uprox, The Daily Beast, NBC News, Vulture, New York Times, NPR, CNN, Vanity Fair, The Atlantic, Billboard, The Guardian, Daily Kos, Advocate, Village Voice, Spin Magazine's editorial by Bob Guccione <laughs> Jr., the Gooch's son. <laughs> the Gooch. Who's a shithead, too. Uh, true dad. True dad. Uh, this book I read today, Sticky Fingers, The Life and Times of Jan Wenner and Rolling Stone Magazine by Joe Hagen. Uh, the Masters, like I said, that little part by Jan Wenner, and also a BuzzFeed article from 2017. So Sounds like you didn't do any research I didn't research do a lick this. of research. Right after he pissed off John Lennon, he goes into the 70s and he's, like I said, he's this tastemaker and they're only putting white men on the covers. And when, like I said, when they put women on there, they have to be sexualized. When he had Linda Ronstadter's cover, he said he wanted her to look like a Tijuana whore. That was the, the dictate that he put out to people. The first time he had Joni Mitchell in the magazine, he had it as part of a story about all of the men she dated. And it was around gross. a lipstick cover. And it wrote all the guys that she dated. Ugh, gross. Which is what a lot of guys, I realized later, Alex Bennett used to say this all the time. Oh, she just fucked the Eagles. That's why she's famous. Like, Ew. Right. First of all, I'm glad she did. If she did, I want to hear all about it. Like, I, There's no shame in that uh, game. Just saying, I would have done the same thing. The Eagles could have had all, all this, this back in the day. <laughs> and Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young. Absolutely. <laughs> but she's kind of more than that. And she yeah. was one of the women that said, yeah, I'm not talking to you and didn't talk to them for seven years after that. That was like, they were also known for giving shitty reviews to people bands that got popular like Led Zeppelin and Deep Purple like anything that got popular disco 
anything that got popular. Oh yes, that just chapped their asses. Yeah, they they are kind of the epitome of what we talked about this in the bonus episode actually about how what women like, what works for women, uh, things from a female point of view is that's garbage. It's not serious. It's it's to be dismissed. Right. You know, and what does serious rock music look like? It's white men and their points of view. And we should also say, like, rock music, we talked about Sister Rosetta Tharp on this mm-hmm. show. I mean, Big Mama Thornton. These are, I mean, Led Zeppelin, all these, all of them, Rolling Stones, all of them admit they listen to black rock music. Yeah. That was their inspiration. Elvis whole routine was based on little richard yes completely stole from little richard mick jagger used to not dance at all in concerts until he saw tina turner dance and then he was imitating tina turner yeah tina turner isn't good enough to interview i mean i just was like chrissy hind from the pretenders i you he went through the entire 70s and he he basically ran a magazine i get that you have to deal with the publishing side you have to deal with the edit there's a lot of decisions you have to make but you're still the editor-in-chief of rolling stone how are you not interested in interviewing stevie wonder in the 1970s songs right. the key of life intervisions like that never like occurred to you to speak to a man who was born blind and like yes and can play all these instruments perfectly and yes. change rock and roll all well of- or do you want to make you know and talk about problematic but like you don't want to talk about Michael Jackson? Like Quincy Jones? Yeah. I mean, these people changed music and it's, but yes. no, it's, it's, these are not masters to him. And it's also, it. it goes to be the culture of Rolling Stone that went on for decades that people were sort of like, well, that's just how some people think that rock is only this narrow thing. And he goes through the seventies and it's pretty much, that's the case. Like a lot of 70s stories, like a lot of boomers, there's cocaine, there's drinking, there are affairs, there's, you know, people taking off for the mountains and leaving for weeks at a time. He is, (laughs) he really loves being around powerful people that makes him feel really special. When he moves to New York, he buddies up with Lorne Michaels. So there's Saturday Night Live and Rolling Stone, that whole Mm -hmm. culture, excuse me. He has Annie Leibovitz also is a big part of Rolling Stone's history. But he would say to her, supposedly she sounds like a real kook, like she would go through cameras and lose them. (laughs) She was constantly late for her bills, like she was always spending money she didn't have because she just couldn't keep track of it. Mm. But he got to a point where Rolling Stone went from putting interesting covers out to all of a sudden it was like a white background. If you look in the 70s, all white background and just people. And that's all for a long, long time. Like that's the dictate. Like those are the people that get on the cover. They move to San Francisco in 19, I'm sorry, New York City in 1977. So then we go into the 80s and then we go into the 80s and there's more women being prominent, like the Go-Go's, for example. But how do they get on the cover of Rolling Stone? They have to be in their underwear, which Mm -hmm. I, I agree that is a part of their image, but it is something they had to do to get on Rolling Stone. Like that, right? It wasn't. They weren't going to ask them about other things. Like that, you had. There's a lot of cheesecake that went on with that. Yes, and it only got worse in the '90s. By the way, it did. And I would say this: Rolling Stone, especially when it started taking being more political and more newsworthy in the '80s, was very well researched. And we, that's one of the ones I pay for, and it's expensive, but. Yeah, I feel like they they had they had a lid on it. They had very good. Um, they had a lot of really interesting articles that came out with the rise of the AIDS crisis, with Abscam, with you know all kinds of you know shenanigans that were going on in the eighties. But they were losing their cool factor because they were now in their forties. They were becoming yuppies. Yeah. So eighty five is when Bob Cuccioni Jr. starts Spin Magazine. Mm-hmm. And that's the alternative magazine. They have hip hop people on there. Now, yeah. he also 
Guccione likes to put out articles that are like, HIV doesn't cause AIDS, does it? I don't think so. Just asking questions. Just asking here. questions. And he also <laughs> had um he had some sexual harassment charges against yes. him. So fuck that guy. Anyway, into the 80s we go, and around 83, he starts to come up with we need to have a rock and roll hall of fame. So and at first, they were going to just make a TV special. We did a lot of TV specials with Rolling Stone. But then yeah. someone said, no, we want to actually make a museum and put it in Cleveland and then have it be a thing every year. Yeah. And they're like, oh, shit, like this could be a whole thing. So he was a part. He was at the chair of the board. They came up with the rules. You, It has to be 25 years after your first single or album. Okay. But who gets in there, right? And of course, it's easy at first. It's like, of course, Chuck Berry and the Beatles and Elvis and James Brown and like all that seems to make sense. But as the years go on, it's like not a lot of women are are here. Right. Not a lot of women seem to make it to the cover or if they they have to be super successful to be considered like Madonna. Right. Right. Madonna. I'm like, maybe Janet Jackson. I think like more 90s than 80s. Yeah. Whitney Houston, maybe in the 90s. Maybe Whitney. I think Hart, when Hart had the big hair, when they were doing yeah. that, that stuff. But it's it, they parse it out very yeah. randomly. Oh, for sure. I'm sure it was like we had a woman on the cover last month. So we can't have a woman on the cover this for another month. year. <laughs> or, yeah. Or, yeah, we already had a woman on the cover this year. They were also very slow with adapting to hip hop and rap yeah. and did not understand like how that had anything to do with rock. It became once again, like this is what rock and roll is. It's like white males. It's about right. Okay. So Jan Wenner, he he's pissed off John Lennon. He's pissed off everybody at some point, but he has so much power that he could, he could take a person like Bono and Bono, he loves Bono. He could take him to Detroit to like the car factories and meet the advertisers and get him to advertise in Rolling Stone. Like mm-hmm. they were, he was very powerful that way. It, it actually sold records. It was a big deal. There were other, so there were some more controversies. One of them's being Hunter S. Thompson, who was one of his, in the 70s, one of his more chaotic yes. hires. You can find videos of... Thompson going into Winter's office and using um, uh, the fire extinguishers like uh, to attack him as he walks into the office. It cracks me up. But he started saying that, uh, you know, he was losing his touch, that he, you know, in the 70s, they were really going for like Watergate and no nukes and all this stuff. Yeah. And then the 80s, sort of like, man, they didn't really seem to whatever. In the 90s, there was, there was, in the 80s, sorry, there started also to be, uh, that uh, there's certain artists that just never got bad reviews, like the Rolling Stones, right? Like, uh, and one day, one of the artists in '96, Jim Dirigotis, uh, he did a review of Hootie and the Blowfish's album. <laughs> Wasn't a fan, and the album was huge, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> And and he got some pushback for it, and he and he he said in an interview the the reviewer, if Winter was a fan of Hootie and the Blowfish, it's because he's a fan of any band that sells eight million records. He got fired the next yeah. day. Like, Damn, they were you're expected to like promote what's popular, yes, and not have an opinion. In twenty, 20- cool, cool job when you're it's your job to actually review things. <laughs> Don't ha- keep that opinion in check, sir. Just yeah, just write glowing things about Keith Richards' solo album, which, by the way, I really right. enjoy. But it's like no one cares. It's like they've been yeah. around forever. In 2017, Jan- well, in 97, Winner's Media, and it included, by the way, Us Weekly, a thing okay. he started in the 80s as a monthly magazine. Somewhere when Bonnie Fuller took it over, it really got popular. And okay. Us Weekly, like every week, they started Benifer and uh, all those like cutesy nicknames for people, Brangelina. Like, yes. That's Us Weekly and that's Bonnie Fuller. Yes. 
And they still they still do the like who wore it better and celebrities. They're just like us. Someone's <laughs> sporting a baby bump. That's what yeah. someone drives me crazy. In ninety, so he's making tons of money from that. But he gets into arguments with Bonnie Fuller. And Bonnie Fuller, I know, because she used to work at Connie Nass when I was at Connie Nass. And she kind of is a okay. prickly personality. So, and he, he wants people that will just do what he wants them to do. Whatever. Of course. Right. But anyway, he, uh, he, they, they part ways and she joins, not the Inquirer, I think the Star Magazine for a little bit. And okay. he was interviewed about it. And he said that she was homely and that that's... She was hard to look at because there's nothing attractive about her. I mean, oh, he's just so cool. shitty. Yeah. Yeah, so, that that means a lot about her work. Exactly. Yeah, what a dick. He's a huge dick. There was a huge scandal with Rolling Stone in 2015 when they reported that there was a rape on campus at UVA. Right. And it was a, and it was a rape, a gang rape situation. And a woman was saying that it was at this fraternity, and that the school wasn't doing anything about it. And up until then, Wenner had kept lawyers on retainer to protect them from libel. So before anything could get published, it had to go through the lawyers, mm-hmm. which is the smart thing to do, especially if you're talking about this subject. Yes, for whatever reason. The person that was in charge of reading it, the lawyer, was quitting her job and didn't read this article. So it was given to somebody else, and the editor of the piece didn't know the other person and had just assumed it had gone through the checks. Turns out Mm. they didn't check up on any of the notes. She didn't get the day, the dates right for the party that supposedly there's names that she got incorrect. There's all kinds of things. And sure, people can have various recollections but you're putting this in print in a magazine you're and when you get yeah and you get those things wrong and it puts everything else in doubt about the accuracy and women get that's one of the first people yeah. saying it's like oh what if she's lying what if she doesn't know what really happened what if she was drunk and mm-hmm. she misconstrued everything the school sued him the UV, the fraternity sued them it was a big ugly blemish he had to uh, appear in court and he actually told the dean of the school who he mentions in the piece is not caring, who happened to be a woman, by the way. Mm-hmm. He's like, I understand. I've suffered just as much as you have. And she's like, yeah, no, you haven't. Like, this is a huge. Yeah. Such a in 1997, Rolling Stone magazine was estimated worth, and this is because they also had Family Life magazine, they had Men's Health magazine, they had uh, Us Weekly, which was making a shitload of money in like the late 90s. At one point, it was worth $1 billion, and somebody offered to buy it from him. And he said, no. You you could buy anything from me for a billion dollars. I'm not even kidding you. Yeah. Yeah. He, at that time, in 95... He mid 90s, he started coming out more as gay. He had been known as somebody that hits on anything that moves and flirted with everybody at his office and would offer sexual favors to people and and expect. Oh, totally normal, which is what a boss does. Totally fine. But he fell in love on one of his trips to the Caribbean, a man named Matt Nye. And they started a relationship. Now, he had been married since 1967. Right. To his wife, Jane, who, even though they were an open, kind of an open marriage, even though they cheated on one another, even though she knew he had gay dalliances, she didn't think he would leave her. Hmm. She loved him very much. They had three kids at this point, three boys. And she was devastated by this. And it took... Over a decade to get this sorted out. I bet he built a huge media empire, right. basically, while married to her. So she's entitled to quite a bit of that money. Yes. And he gets that. Well, when he gets, uh, he sells the magazine and he, he sells off parts of it to people. But Penske Media bought Rolling Stone a couple of years ago. And that's when he left the magazine. Don't worry. His son, Gus, took it over. And I, I think Gus is actually doing a good job. I like Rolling Stone Digital right now. And I, I, it's a good 
source for us and I, I trust it's, them. It's a, it's, yeah, it is a good source for us. And they actually have some really good criticism on the site. Um, they recently got Alan Spinwall, Spiwall, Sp- Spinwall, I think is how you pronounce it, who is a really talented uh, television critic. And that's kind of what finally pushed me over the edge to actually subscribe because he does really great writing about oh, uh, television. Ste- yes. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, because you used to write about television. Yes, I did. So there were certain writers that I still just would read because I think that they have interesting takes and are very honest in their assessments. Yeah. Um, I like his writing, so I still follow him. Yeah, I, I think he was at Newark Star Ledger or something like that. Yeah, he start this he's actually a really fascinating story because he started as like a like a recapper for like NYPD Blue and then it turned into like he started writing television articles for like a local newspaper and then it got syndicated and then he had a whole website that's like what's Alan watching and eventually like got snapped up by I think the Hollywood Reporter, and then he was like at Rolling Stone. Now he's at Rolling Stone. He's at Rolling Stone now. Yeah. No, Hollywood Reporter had Tim Goodman for a while. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. He wrote for the uh, Examiner before I did, and then he wrote for the Chronicle. And he still and, wanted uh, jokes. But his jokes. a lot of people, a lot of he stole some of my jokes. Um, a lot of current like culture critics started as recappers, like Linda Holmes. On NPR, yes. used to do recaps on uh, television without pity. I used to love television without pity. I, me too. Oh my God, the best recaps. Yes, it was the best. Anyway, sidetrack. Sorry. Yeah, we got sidetracked. All right. So I, I keep going back and forth in time just because there's d- different yes. shitty things. Let's go back to 85, by the way. He he sells a story from Rolling Stone. He's like, this is going to be a great movie. It'll be, all be about aerobics. And it's with John Travolta <laughs> and Jamie Lee Curtis, and it's called Perfect. And we uh, will post one of his images in our Facebook group. But it's yes. uh, he plays a version of himself, yes. and he's playing a dickhead version of himself. Like yes, he yells and screams dick. at everybody and treats everyone like shit. It's just hilarious. The movies, it's a terrible movie. We it's, talked it, about honestly, it for dorking it's, out. Yes, yeah, it's. It's actually so bad, it's funny. Um, yes. So if, if you have the patience for that kind of movie, knock yourself out. Um, it's, it's bad. Oh, it's <laughs> terrible. And he thought he did such a good job that he he and John Travolta were going to make movies together. Ew, no, he didn't. <laughs> he did not. <laughs> he also, the first ip- uh, issue of Us Magazine, which like I said, it started as a monthly they gave a very rapturous review of the movie Perfect, so. Surprise, surprise. Let's go to 2000, well, 2017, there's a book that comes out, Sticky Fingers, and that's all about Jan Wenner. He approached a reporter, Joe Hagan, and said, hey, I'd like to, uh, will you help me? I want to do my life story. And they spend four years interviewing him, going through all of his past stuff, and then interviewing all these people that were associated with Rolling Stone in the past. And what he's finding out is that Jan Wenner's kind of a huge dickhead. Like, he yells and screams at people. He fires on a whim. He is an egomaniac. He Mm. was very handsy with people. He flirted with the people who worked with him. There's also a woman that was an amazing writer, Lynn Hirschberger. Hirschberg, excuse me, who was at Rolling Stone that I loved. She said in one of the meetings, he went up to her, put his hands on her hips and said, 10 more pounds and you'll be perfect. (gasps) Oh, gross. I mean, that's again, just people trying to do their jobs. People just trying to do their jobs. And I get it. It's the 80s at the same time. Fuck you. Not everybody did it. It's just gross. Also, there's a person named Ben Ryan who said that in 2005, he was told to meet the publisher at his Upper West Side townhouse because he wanted to talk to him about a potential gig. And Jan has drinks with this guy and basically like put his tongue down his throat and was just pinning him to the couch and promising all kinds of money if he'll come work for them. Now, 
we'll say this, Jan Winter says, that's not how it happened. We had drinks. We made out a little bit. He did the one assignment for us. But, you know, that was all we were contracted to do. He did do the one assignment, but he said, I had Jan Winter's tongue in my mouth. I went along for a second, but then something to the effect of, oh, please, I'm not that kind of girl, went through my head. <laughs> Yenner, Winter had been out for about 10 years at this point. He also, uh, like I said, he, he was with, the, he was at the partner and they would go on to have three kids together. Okay. Uh, anyway, yeah, so Winter is just kind of like, you know, just a little bit sleazy. There's all the these things that are kind of attached to him. And you could kind of say he's a product of his time or whatever. But the reason it was such a big deal when he says that black and female artists are just not in his zeitgeist, it's because since Rolling Stone came out and declared themselves the authority on rock and roll, women and black people were told pretty much explicitly, you're not invited. You're a special guest. You can watch right. what we're doing and you can appreciate our views on it, but you're not welcome here. It's erasing right. people from that deserve to be acknowledged. And I want to just talk about a couple of people who respond. And he immediately, by the way, he was fired from the board and it took like 20 minutes, like the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And there are people saying for years, how come this person and not that person in the Rock and Roll yeah. Hall of Fame? What do they have to do to get in there? And it's sort of like these rules are, I don't know. They're arbitrary. It's like That's sometimes word, yeah. they, they, they apply to some people. They don't apply to others. It's very willy nilly. Do you know the band Living Color? I'm yes. the cult of, I'm the cult of yeah. personality. They started the Black Rock Coalition in 1985 and said this to this, to the, the masters. The very idea of a book called The Masters, which blatantly omits the essential contributions of black people of color, black people of color and women to rock and pop culture speaks a much larger and more systematic problem. And they, it's an insult to all of us who sat at the feet of these overlooked geniuses. It is so exclusionary to say that women and black people don't deserve to be a part of the conversation. It's not just a matter of it's his opinion. He's fucking wrong. And people are allowed yeah. to say when you're doing something wrong. And I want to say this is a, from the... Uh, Spin Magazine, Free Speech in, in Defense of Jan Wenner. This is from the Gooch Jr. Gooch. I have always admired and respected Jan Wenner and still do. I, I, yes, I know what he said in the New York Times and that a day later he was unceremoniously dumped from the board of directors of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, which he co-founded. But isn't he entitled to his opinion? Isn't he? It's inaccurate, and you can't always say someone is wrong in their opinion, but in this case, he's empirically wrong. But he, all he's guilty is expressing their opinion in clumsy language. That's not just clumsy language. Like, once again, this is specifically denying the contributions of people. He then goes on, him, the gooch, goes on to say, I interviewed Sinead O'Connor and Tori Amos, Killer Mike, all these people... And it's like, okay, congratulations. And then he goes right into, <laughs> I know, you know, phony liberals and their problems. And then he talks about that there is an artist who wants to talk about puberty blockers and kids. And it's all of these, you know, Royson Murphy. I think that's how you pronounce yeah. it, Royson Murphy. And it's going back to this ridiculous argument that, these purity blockers and all these things are hurting kids. All these mass kids are being dosed. There's nobody in charge. There's nobody taking. Right. And we and I have talked about this like in, ad nauseum. Like it's between the decision between the kids and their parents and their doctors. Yeah, yeah it's and none it of goes our business. There's so many processes before they go to anything like that. So just casually, Seriously. like, dude, <sighs> you used to say HIV didn't cause AIDS, and now you're like jumping on this fucking train. Like, just shut it your goddamn mouth. Shut, yeah, shut the fuck up. They, they're they acting like they put the shit in vending machines at schools for kids. This is not how it's working. It's none of your fucking business. Yeah. Mind your business. 
Mind your business. Yeah. Fuck the gooch. I also want to say one more time uh, when it came to the book, once again, that that, uh, the Sticky Fingers book, uh, he said that. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Let me look for it. Oh, yeah. This is to a former editor in 1973. He, Jan, fancied himself as sort of a polymorphous, perverse William Randolph Hearst. He joined Rolling Stone in 19... Glenn O'Brien joined in 1973 and quit after what he said were winners' unwanted advances. He told me he'd slept with everyone who had worked for him. So this is like the environment that this is how he treats people. This is his, uh, Mm -hmm. his narcissism. This is his, like, demand that his worldview is more important than anybody else's. He apologized the next day because he knew he fucked up. Right. And I'm sure the publisher gave him a talking to like you, you had all this time to come up with talking points. And you just double publisher should have said something before the book, even an editor should have read that book and been like, where are the women? Where are the people of color? Where's your reasoning for not putting him in there without saying yeah. that because they're inarticulate, because they can't speak for themselves? Well, fuck you. I mean, these are unbelievably, they're, they're, this, it's just a... Uh, it's lazy. It's lazy as fuck. It's, it's lazy and it's ignorant. It's like, try, I don't know, talking to people, asking questions, being curious, not talking to the same five fucking people over and over for 40 years. Like, what a dick. Chuck D, like all these people he could be talking to and yeah. include here, like Dolly Parton, you know, these. Yeah. Oh, my God. How do you not talk to Dolly Parton? She's a. But he's an asshole. Right. Anyway, that's our creep this week. Jan Winner. Good job, my friend. What a fucking dick. He's just such a dick. If we. One of the original names for the show. What a dick. What a dick. (laughs) Good job, my friend. Thank you, my friend. Do you want to hear about a magazine that's not as creepy? Yes, please. Okay. I decided to go with a, a publication over a person. So I wanted to talk about Ms. Magazine. So it's MS period Ms. Magazine. Uh. It was the first magazine in America that was owned, run, and written by women. It was co-founded in 1971 by Gloria Steinem. She's a journalist, social, political activist, in case people don't know. And Dorothy Pittman Hughes. She was a black feminist, child welfare advocate, and a lifelong community activist. She died last year. Um, so from like 1972 to 87, it was a monthly magazine and it's now quarterly, but you can go to their website and it's updated all the time. So before Ms. Magazine, most magazines marketed to women were about like finding a husband, Mm -hmm. saving marriages, raising babies, using the right cosmetics, you know, cooking, things like that. Um, one of the co one of the other like editors of the magazine said once women's interests are much more profound than how to make meatloaf 12 different ways. <laughs> so again, written by and published by women. Um, it was the first U S magazine, uh, that talked about abortion. The first to explain and advocate for the equal rights amendment to rate presidential candidates on women's issues It talked about domestic violence and sexual harassment on its cover, like before any other magazines were doing that. It did a national study on date rape before anybody was talking about it. Um, And then they like were very much about like the influence of advertising on magazine journalism. So the idea that like if you placed an ad in, I'm just, if you, whatever magazine, whatever lady magazine, and then they give you a good review, you know, that sort of thing. They called all that kind of stuff out. They also had pages devoted to like women's history and to stories and poetry that are written by women. And so it's not just about what they covered too. There were like women writers, women reporters that couldn't cover like real stories like they weren't allowed to um i just recently watched the movie on hulu about 
Oh God, who was it? The one with Kira, Kira Knightley. Uh, about the Boston Strangler. Do you remember? Oh Did- yes, yes, yes. And there was a whole thing where like women weren't allowed to report on things like that. Um, when they did, like, they would, like, run their picture with the story. Like, it was very weird. But, um, so even, like, female reporters, they were, like, pigeonholed into this idea of, like, writing about women's issues. And women's issues, though, were, like, fashion, cooking. Um, this one female reporter said that she wanted to write about the mayor in her town. And she was told she could only write about the mayor's wife. Oh, Jesus. You know, it's like... It's just, it's just such bullshit. It's just so stupid. Um, it was one of the first mainstream magazines that it had like Alice Walker wrote for it, Tony Morrison, um, uh, Judy Bloom considered it like one of her like influences. She said it helped her feel less alone. Um, let's see. Bah, 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 where? Oh, at one point, like um, this prominent male journalist, he like said that the magazine wouldn't last long that women would run out of things to say. Oh yeah. Yeah. And, um, cause we don't talk. (laughs) Yeah. We don't talk. Uh, so in 2020 it, it released its first podcast called on the issues with Michelle Goodwin that still has new episodes all the time. They just did one about the 50 years of hip hop and they interview um, a lot of the women that are in the documentaries that I've talked about in past episodes. Yeah. About like women's contributions to hip hop. Um, They also have a whole bunch about the various Trump indictments. I mean, they'll never run out of material if they want to do that. Um, I went to the website today and they have, a stories about like banned voices from the classroom, how they're like removing books by like <sighs> voices that aren't white men. Basically um, they're talking about the oppression of Afghan women. Um, they are, they have stories about abortion rights all over the country about course of control. And just two weeks ago, a book came out called 50 years of Ms. the best of path best of the pathfinding magazine that ignited a revolution and it's got all kinds of like stuff about the the art covers the photos um and then there's uh pieces by or about bell hooks my love i'm reading bell hooks Mm -hmm. right now alice walker nancy pelosi billy jean king tony morrison um eleanor norton allison bechdel and bechdel Bechtel, mm-hmm. thank you. And Brittany Cooper, among many others. Um, when I went to the website, I started reading a bunch of stuff and I was like, um, this is really good. And I immediately subscribed. <laughs> good. <laughs> so you could just go to MsMagazine.com if you want to subscribe. I think it's very cool. I know there was um Katrina Longworth just was talking about this magazine like a couple episodes ago. And uh I should have signed up then. But it's uh, it's good stuff. That's a great, great job, Sonia. Thank you. They definitely had they've had problems. They've been called out for like um, sometimes like being too like it's like the idea that they're like too feminist. But then they're like you're it was the idea of you're too radical and then or you're not radical enough or. Mm-hmm. How are you like what? Why aren't you covering like issues for lesbians more? Why aren't you there needs to be more coverage of uh, issues for rural women over urban women, like all the stuff. And it's like I feel like from what I've read, it sounds like they are constantly trying to learn from their mistakes and adapt mm-hmm. and like um, which is what they should do. Which yes, should, like just admit like, hey, like we fucked it up and we're going to do better. And it seems that that's what this magazine does. And I like that. So I want to say nobody's, also nobody's perfect. No one's perfect. And I want to say, Sonia, that also Rolling Stone magazine also denigrated his remarks and, and said, you know, yes, he was our founder. Yes, yeah, was my dad. But no, <laughs> it's not OK, because they completely <laughs> um, report about women and hip hop now. Like it's a big part of the the. Um, the editorial there. Yeah. But good job, Sonia. Well, if you like the sound of our voices and would like to hear us talk about a comedy that is a favorite, (laughs) 
of ours. We co-host a show called Dorking Out, where we dork out about films. What are we talking about next, Sonia? The Brady Bunch movie from 1995. I watched it last night. It's streaming on Amazon Prime, y'all. It holds up. I'm going to be watching it today. I'm looking forward to it. Please, once again, send us your suggestions at all those places I mentioned at the top of the show. We love when you use, use the Annie Potts gift. We got one from Ghostbusters or use something of your own. Our email, once again, is whatacreeppodcast at gmail.com. If you'd like some stickers, let us know. If you like what you hear, please uh, leave a review and all that stuff. If you don't like it, just move about your day. You don't have to, we don't have to go anywhere. We could just You didn't make it to the, this part of the show anyway. Right. <laughs> In the meantime, everybody, uh, we'll be back next week with a new episode. Stay safe. Be calm. Be nice. Don't be a creep. Be creep. Thank you for listening to us talk about creeps. You can follow us at What A Creep Podcast on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. But don't follow us too closely. You can email us your creepy stories at whatacreeppodcast at gmail.com. But please keep your dick pics to yourself. (laughs) Ha, ha, ha.